Um, right, so um, that's Andrew. Hey, uh, Supreme yeah. Supreme yeah. there we go. Um, he will make noises for you later. Um, uh, and Andrew, Andrew and I started to. Because uh, I had a cow's lick when I was at school, so my nickname was Moo. Like everyone at school called me Moo, and then my brother came and he had the same cow's lick. So they called him Moo. So I was like, no, but I'm the supreme. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You might surprise you that he's actually the brains behind the operation. Yeah. <laughs> so and, Andrew pretty much like, you know, is the deep technologist. I grew up, grew up programming and then got sucked into the dark side of product management. Um, and then took some time and like got back into coding again, which is which has been great. Um, and like for those of you who don't know us, uh, Gitter is a community platform for developers to come and talk. Um, we launched in kind of February last year and we stayed in beta for a while and tried to be a bit undercover and then came out of beta and we've been growing quite rapidly now. We've got 120,000 people on the platform, there are around 20 odd thousand um, public communities on, on Gitter, and we're active kind of all the time. And I think, you know, this is less of a sales thing and just more of a background to um, some of the things you'll we'll, we'll talk about today is that we've grown really quickly and we've launched a lot of features really quickly, and we've only got a small team of like four people. We just brought two more on board. Um, but pretty much everything you, you see was built by four people in a very short space of time. Uh, we ship often. I put a lot of pressure on people to, to ship um, all the time. Uh, we've done 502 releases in a year and a half. If we just look at the kind of re release branches on, on our GitHub repos. Um, that's, yeah, that's with Hotfix branches. Yeah. Um, and that's just of the main the main app, we have other like sort of smaller apps and everything. So we're shipping a lot and Jenkins is building all the time and there's a lot going through the pipeline. Um, and that kind of, I guess, leads me to Zawinski's law, which is uh, every program attempts to expand until it can read email. And um, like that's kind of what happened with, with, with us. You know, we started with basically just chat and you know, we're very engaged with people and listening to them all the time and we just sort of add features all the time and I guess the, the lesson here is that, you know, small projects can quite quickly turn into big projects and some of the considerations around like managing a larger code base and managing a lot more features start to really change when this kind of stuff happens to you. Um, so, without further ado, um, Act 1 is we're going to talk about some performance bits and pieces. Some of you will have noticed if you've used the product a lot that um, it was starting to get a bit crumbly and a bit slow in places. Um, there were some like multiple reasons for that and we spent a lot of time over the last three or four months really focused on this, both on the back end side and on the front end side. We're going to talk a lot more on you know three or four little front end things that we've done to, to really help with that. A couple of things to bear in mind is this is uh, actually a screenshot from my phone and then pasted into a, another thing. Um, and that was like the data speed I was getting here in New York City, which is an entire five megs a sec. I don't know if that's normal or not. Um, yeah, pretty bad, I imagine. But, you know, it got me thinking like the, the network is still the bottleneck, right? And you know, with front-end code, we're pushing as much stuff down the wire as possible, and we'll talk about some of the things that we've done to reduce that, but we've got a global audience, and, you know, 4.5 megabits per second is the global average. This is from Akamai. Um, speed test, like, don't believe what they say. I think it's just people moving into their fiber and they go, speed test. Yeah! <laughs> Look at that! Which is what I do all the time. Um, <laughs> But, you know, that's, like, not good, right? And if you are unsympathetic about that, um, it can make your app really sucky and slow. Um, and the other thing to, to think about is, like, hands up, MacBook Pro, like, MacBook type fairly beastly machines. No? Mm -hmm. One or two people? Okay. Um, like, d generally developers have good kits. You know, if you read anything that's, like, Stack Exchange, uh, write about, you know, look after your developers, just buy them the best kit and let them do stuff. And, you know, we see a lot of people on not the best kits and they don't have super fast CPUs and, you know, the, the, 
kit is different and things can run slower and so kind of think about some of these things. Um, there are two great tools that we use um, in particular for the network side of things which is um, uh, OS X has got a network link conditioner and then you can also in DevTools throttle the network and so like push those things down a little bit and see how things behave because if you're building an app that's not just used by people in the first world and with amazing bandwidth actually I say first world that's not even completely true at all in, in London our like, infrastructure broadband wise is not really good residentially we get 12 megs at home yeah, I get like four. <laughs> so a free tool by the way yes uh, this you can download from developer.apple.com um, and if you go into like OSX uh, tools, you can download it there and it goes into your preferences panel. And it's an excellent tool and you can set up like um, the speed of your link but then also the round trip time and, and everything like that. Because for example, people in, in uh, New Zealand, they might have a very fat pipe but there might be a 600 millisecond round trip to get to your service in Virginia. Um, and it doesn't matter that they've got a really beefy connection, there's still the speed of light to take into account, and, and so that that tool is fantastic for for managing that. Great. So um, scene one. Uh, so Chuck Norris. Not many of you know that Chuck Norris was actually Doctor Strangelove, um, and he played all the characters in Doctor Strangelove, and he was the bombs in Doctor Strangelove. Um, but like one of the mistakes we made is assuming jQuery is fast enough, and the, the reason I bring this up is this is Chuck Norris's keyboard, um, and he obviously doesn't need any letters anywhere, and he doesn't even need jQuery because you know, on a UK keyboard that's where the dollar sign would be. Um, so that's just Chuck, because he just knows that like he invented the dom, right? Um, so, but like in all seriousness, look, jQuery is a great tool, and we obviously know it's like underneath all like a lot of the things that we use. Um, and it allows rapid cross-browser development, and it's a simple API, and everyone can kind of understand it. But it, it can have performance issues, and like especially on large collection views, and if you're iterating and looping over things and doing them multiple times, um, they, it can get a bit slow. And oh, damn it! Uh, yeah. So this is just like a little demo um, that we put together of jet lag behind us. Um, over here, this is going to be a jQuery toggle, and this is going to be Chuck Norris's toggle. Um, and what all this is going to do is basically toggle a class on this um, element over here called wow, and it's going to do it 999 times, um, and that's what it will do. And if you do it with jQuery, it'll take you know that amount of time. Sometimes it's, I mean, ah, sometimes it's a bit faster, but that's kind of what it does. And then with Chuck Norris's toggle, where he's basically just going straight onto the class list and um, you know, adding some stuff there, it's basically like uh, a lot faster, right? Um, obviously, that's extreme. You're probably on toggling things 999 <laughs> times, but you know that's kind of the point. And we got a lot of performance optimizations out of taking jQuery out of certain things that we do really frequently. We are quite lucky because we don't have to support like really old browsers, which is what jQuery is great for. Um, but if you, you know, we're supporting IE 10 and up, and so we've got things like class lists and everything. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to leave questions till the end, but, but keep talking. Yeah. Um, so do you want to talk about cool. some of these things? Okay. Um, so with finding, obviously we've spent quite a lot of time recently finding performance problems. Um, and Obviously, the first thing to, to realize is never optimize too early um, because it's the root of all evil, premature optimization. Um, and for with the work that we did in Marinette, it's really important to focus on your collection views and your composite views because if you are sort of optimizing the render time of a component that there's a single instance of in your app and it gets started at, at startup and never gets rendered again, uh, you can make it a thousand times faster and no one will notice a difference. But if you've got a big collection view with two, three hundred items in it, if you can really sort of bring that down, uh, you'll make a huge difference to the speed of your application. Um, so the first thing I just want to point out is the DevTools timeline is the most awesome thing 
on the planet, and I recommend that everyone use it all the time. Um, Hands up who has used this. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So we use that a lot, and especially when we were trying to improve the front end performance, it really helped a lot. Um, so I'll just give you like an example walkthrough of something that we found was like really, really, really dog slow. Uh, we were using a Bootstrap tooltip. I don't know if anyone's used it before. Um, and uh, what we found was that it was actually taking like more than a millisecond uh, every time you called like $x.tooltip. And uh, in our chat item view, you know, we might have 200 items and uh, on each of those items we've got two tooltips. We've got one on the avatar and we've got another one on the, um, on the date and time. And so if you have got 200 items and you've got like two milliseconds to, to, um, to initialize that, it's going to take you like half a second just for that. And that's just the tooltips. You've got to do the rest of the page and everything. So, you know, here you can see that sort of um, behavior and, and so we look to sort of optimize that. So we've got a, we use behaviors wherever we can in Marinette. Um, I don't know if you guys use them, but they're fantastic. And so what we'd managed to do was we took the um, tool to behavior and we, we initialized it on the first mouse over of the event. So instead of, so, sorry, of the, of the element. So when you mouse over an element, it basically sets up the tooltip at that point and, and brings it up. Um, and so what we found was that the tooltips went from like one millisecond, two milliseconds, down to like 0 0.05 milliseconds, and that cut like half a second off our rendering time just doing that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's super useful. Um, yeah, cool. Another like very easy one with Marinette is uh, attach L content. Um, so in Marinette 2, there's this like um, method which you can override, and what it does is uh, takes your rendered string and sticks it into your DOM. And the default implementation is just uh, this guy over here. Um, but what you can do is you can sort of shortcut it. You can override it, and you can shortcut it, and just say if it's a string. Just do in HTML equals whatever, uh, and that is that gives you massive performance gains. So we tend to use it as a mix-in, and we mix it into uh, things that are inside collection views, and it's, it makes a huge difference. So there's there's an idea of of dollar uh, uh, HTML versus in HTML. So you, you can save lots, and that's like a really easy change you can make, um, and you get those sort of performance gains. And the next thing that we did, which made a really big difference to our application, was uh, changing it so that we pre-rendered all of our content on the server before we sent it across to the client. Um, and it's a really good practice, so if you can do it, I'd highly recommend it. Um, there's obviously advantages for SEO and for doing Google indexing and all that sort of thing. But more than that, the, the perceived page load, even though the page actually takes around about the same amount of time to load, the perceived time is, is, is much, much, much faster, so users have a much better experience. Um, and also, you avoid multiple page reflows. So instead of the application sort of loading and then things moving around and then like as collection views are populated, they sort of change the, the layout of your screen, it just, it just sort of gets presented and then the JavaScript loads. And, Everything's just much, much smoother and like less janky. So I highly uh, recommend doing it. Uh, the problem is that we found with Marinette is I, I don't really know of a very easy way to do it. And certainly the way that we've done it is quite messy. Um, so we use handlebars as our templates um, engine on the server. And we've basically extended it with a whole bunch of like uh, helpers that help us to like pre-render the data on the server and take that data and, uh, and, and use the same templates that, we re that we're rendering on the client to render them on the server. Um, and we also use a whole bunch of like extensions to Marinette on the client to let us like mount pre-rendered data into like a view hierarchy. Um, so what I've done on the next slide is I've just kind of disabled a little bit of the pre-rendering on, on Gitter because it's quite hard to actually disable all of it. So I've disabled a little bit of it. 
and you can sort of see if you notice a difference. And this is all running on my local computer, so it's a lot faster than what would happen in a... So, it's, you, can, you can see, obviously, the one on the, on the left on the uh, left is pre-rendered, uh, and the, the one on the right is in uh, But when you're going across the network, the, the effect is, is, is much greater. So, uh, so in order to do this, there was like a whole lot of changes that we had to make to Marinette. Um, it would be really nice to sort of, well, extensions that we had to make to Marinette. We, we didn't change the base classes, we kind of extended the classes with, with what we call the isomorphic layout view. And the isomorphic layout view, basically, uh, at initialization time, it looks at the region that it's going to be mounting a view into. And if the region already contains content, then it mounts it as uh, onto the existing content. And if the region is empty, then it just uh, instantiates instantiate it like normal. Um, so I don't know if you're aware, but in, in Marinette, you can basically, if you give a, a view an element and you say template false, it will mount onto an existing uh, DOM element. And so what the Isomorph Playout view lets us do is basically sort of automate that process. So as the views are mounting, they just get mounted on, and, and um, obviously this becomes like more important when you have a hierarchy of views, and sort of the, the, the base view mounts, and then the child view mounts, and it sort of goes down like that. Um, and then the, the second thing that we had to do was extend collection views and composite views. Uh, because if you've got, say this is like the data that's been pre-rendered on the server, and it's come down, and then you get the data sort of loaded uh, in clients. Uh, if you just use a normal collection view, it'll just sort of bodge them in here, and you'll get duplicate entries. So what you need to do is tell the collection view when it's loading, right, like take this guy and bind it to that existing element. Uh, and it's quite easy to do. You, use, uh, you can override child view options, which is a standard um, method in, in Marinette. Uh, and it takes the model that you're going to create the element from, uh, or the, the view from, and then all you have to do is really look through the view, uh, sorry, look through your existing URL element and try and match up on the ID to the existing pre-rendered content, and if it's there you can return the elements and just say don't render it, just attach to the existing content, and through doing that you sort of, uh, you can bind to the, the pre-rendered content. So, like all of these things are like little hacks, but when you put them together, it makes a huge difference to, to the performance. Cool. Right, so, <laughs> next one is uh, too much JSON. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so this is a, a, an actual quote, which is uh, 640 people ought to be enough for any room. and. Um, when we kind of originally designed um, our product, we never imagined that we'd have rooms with you know huge and huge amounts of people in them. And actually, in reality, we have rooms where they're like almost 6,000 people. Um, and if you think about what I was saying about the network earlier, um, we weren't being very sympathetic towards that. So this was actually in the people roster that you see on the right-hand side, the um, Jason coming down where we've got a whole bunch of um, stuff in there and we're pushing it all down the wire every time even though there were only you know like 12 odd people displayed there because you know rooms weren't really going to get that much bigger and when you hover over someone we show a bit more information and so maybe you need some of this stuff sitting around right and so if you've got 5,000 people in a room that's uh, one, one and a half megs of just JSON coming down um, and we've got like the retina and the non-retina avatar URLs and like fields that aren't really being used so much um, and that was basically causing like seconds worth of delay certainly on people with um, bad connections and also you know it's contending with a lot of other resources that are being loaded at the same time um, and so how we represent them now is we've kind of slimmed them down right so in, instead of uh, one and a half megs we basically got you know, 350k, and then rather than pushing them all down the wire, we'll just push the first 25, which is what we display, and then we'll go and fetch the other ones if and when needed. And I think, you know, the lesson here is, 
once again, if you, if you have a global audience and if you consider that kind of metric I showed you earlier on um, network performance, is you know try and like slim down and we, we call these things um, like we, we have the serializers that basically take our data serialize them into JSON and as much as possible we've created lean serializers where it's the minimum amount of content needed to show what's on the screen right there and then and then go and fetch other data if and when necessary um, <coughs> The last scene in performance is for Andrew. This is sort of not really a performance thing, but it's a it's a memory thing. So uh, one of the problems we were finding was that um, uh, we had we had quite a few memory leaks, and we had to put quite a lot of effort in to find them and get rid of them. And obviously, the number one thing to do is to make sure that you're not using dot on too much. I think that's like easy giveaway, you can go through your code and most of the places, were, in our code at least, where we were using on there was no matching uh, dot off in on destroy and so you just end up with like zombie views and memory leaks uh, yeah not a, not a happy site so there's two sort of ways that we find this happens uh, the first one is you use jQuery's on and you effectively just bind to some DOM event in jQuery uh, like that. And the problem is, if that view gets destroyed, um, the it doesn't get unbound, and you, you end up with like horrible memory leaks and zombie views and, and all of that badness. And then the second one is sort of the, the really old backbone way of listening to like a model, which is just using on. Um, and unfortunately, this is like pretty terrible. Like we had some backbone code around that was still from like before they brought in listen to and it was actually still using dot on and it just like leaks memory like a surf because you know people forget to, to clear it off um, so I guess there's like a, another lesson which is that when these uh, frameworks get updated like try to keep your, your code up to date and, and maintain your technical debt um, and there's a, the, another thing that we found caused quite a few problems is set timeouts for, for very long timeouts, like like several minutes or ten minutes. Um, like if you look at the time ago, we've got a, a widget that tells you like this message was sent ten minutes ago, and then uh, when it becomes an hour, it changes to an hour, and so that's actually like a set timeout of, of an hour effectively. And if you don't clear your set timeouts, those will also effectively leak memory. So you've got to you've got to make sure that you clear those out as well. I mean, it's a bit of a special case, but so obviously, uh, Marinette has like really great solutions for this. Use your model events and your events and your collection events. And if you're going to listen to like uh, something that extends backbone or events, obviously use listen to. And the nice side effect is that the context of the function is always this, so you don't have to do like bind or self equals this or any of that nonsense, you can just use it. Um, and obviously when your view gets destroyed, Marinette will, or Backbone will clear that, actually no, Marinette will clear that out for you um, and, and unbind those. So that's definitely the way to go. Uh, and if you, you do need to use on, then just make sure you also call that off as well. And same thing with your clear timeouts and your undestroy methods, because otherwise you're going to leak memory. Um, and in terms of finding uh, memory leaks, I, I've got like a pretty basic way of doing this. Uh, but effectively, what I do is I open up the application, I take a heap snapshot, um, and then I really mess around and I like jump around and I search and I and I basically spend a whole lot of time trying to mess up everything. And then I take another heap snapshot. Uh, and the first thing you'll see is when you, when you do it, there'll be a little size over there. And if the second one is substantially bigger than the first one, then you know you've probably got memory leaks. Um, but then what you can do is that you can't see it on the screen at all, but there's a little pull down there. And if you change that to comparison, and then you select your first uh, snapshot, it will show you all the deltas between the first one and the second one. So you can uh, take a look at what uh, objects have been created that haven't been destroyed, or you know, vice versa, and it's actually like a super easy way to, to find memory leaks. Um, I don't know, there might be other ways to do it, but that works for me. Um, cool. <coughs>
the book. So that's pretty much the uh, <clears throat> end of the performance section. The second bit is on um, software design mistakes. And um, actually, sorry, Andrew's going to talk as well. Okay. Cool. So uh, another mistake we made was we uh, coupled a lot of our view components together, and that's something that is very easy to do, but actually really lets us in the bottoms quite badly. Um, so obviously at school we all taught like how to structure an MV, MVC or MVP or whatever you know the current flavor is application and your views are all uncoupled from one another and you've got a model and you change the model and uh, the view responds to events and changes your DOM or, or does something else and you don't couple your views together and we all taught that and we all know that but uh, you know when you're working on a deadline and you've got to deliver something and Mike's going why is this not in production yet? <laughs> no, uh, you know sometimes it's just easier to cut corners uh, and so you might do something like horrible like this, where you you just basically get a reference to the other view, and you just call a method on it, and it's like so quick and easy, and like no harm's been done, and no one finds out, and it's awesome, and, and effectively you have like this coupling between these two views, uh, and everything seems fine. But then the problem is, is he going to play? Oh, there you go. Uh, the problem is that pretty soon, like all your views have got references to other views and you've just got you've actually got this horrible spaghetti of like views that are like completely coupled together. Um, and that on its own would be a problem. But the problem is that that guy he comes in and he goes, we've got to completely change like our view hierarchy. So we've got to put these guys and these guys and this thing's gonna move over there. And as soon as that happens it becomes really hard to to change things because everything's coupled together and you've got to move all the references around. Or another thing that might happen is that you decide that in a certain environment, like with an unauthenticated user or in a mobile environment, you can remove a component completely and then you start getting null pointer exceptions and it's, it's horrible. Um, so Backbone has, sorry, Marinette's got like some good solutions for this. The, the backbone uh, route is to just use a shared model and only make changes to the model. Uh, and obviously, Marinette's got Reka, and uh, Marinette 3, I believe, has got, is going to have um, backbone radio as its like uh, sort of message bus. I don't know what you call it, message bus yes. solution. Um, and so, like, this is just something I made up. We don't actually use this because we don't use radio yet, but like. A much better way of coupling those two components together. You could create an imaginary behavior called radio and you just sort of declare what uh, commands you're going to comply to in your uh, radio in your in your radio behavior. So you can sort of say when we see a chat focus uh, command just call like the focus chat message and then you might have another view and uh, he will just um, You'll just declare a radio and then you can say like this is the radio the command to, to, to issue the command. And if you do that, it's, things are like much less tightly coupled and you can move things around and the hierarchy of your views doesn't affect like how they communicate with one another and just it's a much better solution, I think. Um, cool. Cool. So <clears throat> scene two here is um, Messing with another view's DOM. And I think this is kind of very similar to what Andrew was just talking about, where sometimes it's easier just to like hack something to get it working. Um, and you know, it can lead to some pretty bad stuff. So, you know, a quick and dirty way is that some component somewhere needs to change based on something that happens somewhere else. So for example, uh, once again in, in Gitter, you can set the topic by saying slash topic. Um, and actually what that was, you know, we were like, okay, cool, let's put these commands in, they're all great, let's see if people use them, and what that did is slash topic went to the head of you at the top and basically um, set its uh, HTML, text. Yeah. right, its text, um, which is really bad, because now all of a sudden you've got something very similar to what Andrew was just showing you, this sort of, like, coupling of, of, of views, but kind of also, has uh, anyone coded, like, C, C++, once upon a time, ever, right? 
So we kind of like to think of it like that, right? Where in C++ you can basically go and um, like modify the contents of like something else in, in memory, right? And this is just a very, very bad idea. And now imagine that the DOM is like global memory, shared by all of the different components and views and everything running your application. And each view in your app like manages its own distinct like little bit of DOM. And um, you know, if you go and start m reaching out into other views and start manipulating that bit of code, um, it's kind of a bit like doing that. And it's just really bad practice. Um, and you might ask why? Um, well, because number one is refactoring becomes a nightmare, right? And um, you know, you're going to get a whole bunch of spaghetti. And you know, one of the realities of building software in a like, rapidly changing environment is that um, you, you need to go back and refactor things and get them into better shape. And this becomes really difficult if all of a sudden, you know, things are talking to other things in the wrong way. Um, because you, you, you know, you're creating these hidden connections that aren't necessarily well articulated in your code. And then someone new comes into the team and they're going to struggle to understand like, you know, what all these connections look like if they're, if they're not structured very well. Um, so, I couldn't actually find any Hollywood thing that was basically about this, right? Um, no movie reference whatsoever, and well, it wouldn't be a tech talk if it didn't have a picture of a cat in it. So, is that like, is that just a London thing, or do, do people do that like... Oh, it's everywhere. Good, everywhere. Yeah, good, yeah, right. yeah. Universal. Um, good. Universal <laughs> kittens, basically. Uh, he's kind of wrapped up like a module, maybe. Um, I don't know. Um, but uh, actually, what was the whole lesson here? Sorry. Uh, right. Uh, right. Different module formats. Yeah. Yeah, this is... So um, when we started building Git, uh, um, Webpack and Browser Refi weren't very well established, and so we sort of went with the default at the time, I think, which was require JS uh, as a way of packaging up our client code. Um, and obviously, that means that we used MD modules on the clients, and we used common JS modules for Node on the server. Um, which is fine, but um, what we found is that we started having like code duplication and it's quite difficult really if you've got one module format for one set of code, another module format for another, to actually really effectively um, share that code. So sometimes we might have a little script that wraps it up, but other times, it, normally what happened was people just duplicated the code on the clients and on the server, um, and that's not a good thing. Another thing that we found is that um, all, well, all the test sets run in Phantom JS on the client. So that's quite slow, and I find it like really hard to debug, you know. And and, and also, it's very different from from Chrome. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, WebKit, but you know, when you really get into the innards of it, it's actually a very different different beast. Um, and obviously, on the server, we were using Node.js with with Mocker tests. Um, and so at one point we decided to take a plunge and we switched everything across to Webpack um, and a lot of people say, well why didn't you go with Browserify and I think Webpack just works really well for us and uh, Browserify is also an excellent project and it's got slightly different design goals but they're awesome but like I don't really want to get into a fight with anyone about which one's better <laughs> but Webpack's very good for us yeah. and we're very happy with it. Um, and what that means is that we're using CommonJS on the clients and CommonJS on the server and that's like such an awesome thing. So we've moved like tons of code into this like new root level library called Shared and all of that code can get tested on the, on the server and run as part of like our automation tests instead of it being this like flaky test that runs in, in PhantomJS and takes like ages to complete. Um, so we like super happy with, with making that move and we're just trying to find like all that old duplicate code and move it down into, into these shared modules. And there are some complications because generally on the server we're using sort of arrays of plain objects and on the client we're using um, backbone collections. So there's, there's, there's a few little adapters that we've got to make but you know it's, it's so much simpler than, than having duplicate code. Um, yeah. So. Another thing that Webpack gives us, and this is kind of like just a real bonus extra, is that it's got this amazing thing called require.insure. And effectively what that means is that 
all the code inside the, the callback uh, doesn't get loaded on your first load of your of your of, of, of your page. So it only gets called when it's needed. So we like pretty much everything that we've got in our backbone router, we don't load it when the when the page gets loaded from the server. But when you navigate to say there's a little markdown view that gives you some help on markdown, um, what it does is it will go back to the server, it'll get some extra JavaScript, and then execute that JavaScript when it's come back. And that brings your code size down dramatically because uh, you, your, your initial code is like way smaller. And all the extra bits that people might do like once a fortnight only get downloaded from the server when they need it. Um, and so we do that wherever we can. Anything that's sort of uh, asynchronous and it's, it's only sort of user-driven and we can, we can bring it up later, we try to do that. And obviously, the other thing that Webpack does is, is it won't just bring down that single file. It will bring down the sort of whole hierarchy of dependencies of that file. So it's a it's like a really awesome uh, thing, and I highly recommend Webpack. Cool. Um, so I mean, that's pretty much it. I guess we just wanted to make a couple of closing remarks, and it's probably a bit of duplication about what we said earlier, but. Um, I think it's just kind of important to reiterate, and there's basically like two natures of problems that we're talking about here, um, and, they're, and they're actually both really closely related. It's like number one is code debt, um, and you know these are basically just sort of technical problems that will that will come in if you've got a small team and you're moving really fast and you're pushing out a lot of code and. Um, like you know, I'm more of a product person than I am a, a te technology person. I, I do I do a bit of code myself and kind of like changing things around a little bit and making changes here and there. And this, you know, this can kind of back up quite easily. And product people will often always, uh, you know, I used to get this a lot of, as like when I was only doing product management and I was really far away from code as your engineers would kind of ask you to like pay now or pay later and like what's a product manager going to say he's like yeah, yeah pay, pay later pay later pay later <laughs> like if you ever work with a product person like don't even give them that option like as much as possible try and pay off your your technical debt um, and so you know like a good example of this is when we first adopted marionette it was just like a neat little extension for some things that backbone wasn't giving us um, uh, like so collection views and so we didn't really use it to it it's, to its full potential and you can see you know some of the other examples where we had some older kind of styles left around that created problems and then Andrew spent about a month upgrading from Marionette 1 to Marionette 2 um, quite recently and you know it was a super painful process. It, it, it wasn't really, the, like, the Marinette upgrade was, was a few days, but it was actually at the same time, it was all that technical, all that debt that we were trying to get rid of. Yeah, so he's basically um, going through like, you know, everywhere you've seen all of these nasty, like, you know, spaghetti code bits and just trying to just restructure that app in a great way. And like, since we've come out of it now, we actually find that we can run even faster because everything's just really well structured and you're not, you don't have those problems where you know you push something in over there and something pops out over there. Um, but we just kind of think it's interesting to show the, um, the Marinette 2 pull request that Andrew sent. Um, and like, a lot of this has not got to do with Marinette 2, it's got to do with just spending a lot of time paying more for tech. Okay. <laughs> it's, okay, that's uh, no, <laughs> it's, that's it's not, scary, no, no way. Scary, uh, the amount of deletions versus, versus creations there. And that just made the code base more manageable. Um, and it's, you know, if you can somehow take the time to do that when you are doing something like switching from you know, one version of something to the other, 
um, you'll come out of it in a much, much better state. Um, and then, you know, secondly is like, you know, a lot of these things are probably not problems in small applications or, you know, we've got a long-lived SPA. Um, it's, you know, things are open all the time and so memory, memory is really important to us. Uh, we've seen like long-lived apps running that could, like will take two gigs of memory, uh, which is just bonkers to us. And, we, you know, we're really we're trying to be as sympathetic as possible to this. Um, but you know, this, a lot of this just because we started off with something small and it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew and uh, I know it's kind of, it's easy to stay but you know, as, as a team just like try as much as possible just start as you mean to, to, to go on and try and like maintain that rigor around doing things properly because otherwise it's going to slow you down um, you know, we, when we had some, some of these performance issues that you know, people were going like, "Oh, you need to like react the whole thing," and you know, it like it's, it was it wasn't that, and like we lost customers as a result of it because things were going too slowly, and it can it can hurt you. And so, you know, we, we thought it was just really important to share some of the things that we learned there, some of the mistakes we made, and you know, maybe some tips, um, like things you haven't you haven't used or things you haven't heard of, um, in, in particular, uh, pre-rendering stuff on the server. Buys us a lot. Um, so, like, that's pretty much it. And I know there was like a lot of info, and maybe there was like a question earlier. If, if anyone has some questions, like, go wild. About anything as well. You mentioned that jQuery was a problem. Was jQuery the problem or was it Sizzle underneath? It's uh, a lot of this stuff isn't sizzle because we use uh, UI hashes um, all over the show. So the the select sizzle's the um, selector library, isn't it? It's it's for doing the query, and because we're using the UI hashes, those get bound once, like on render, um, and then after that, we've basically got a reference to a jQuery array, um, and so it's not actually it's probably not sizzle that's the problem. Because we, you know, we've just got uh, we've we've got a reference and we've got the query already. We're not reissuing that query on every uh, render. Does that make sense? Yeah, I suppose, and that's another reason to use UI hashes rather than like this dot dollar dollar uh, l dot find all over your code because you're not issuing those queries all the time. Obviously, you can't do that if you're changing the HTML dynamically. You know, or changing a DOM dynamic. So, so, uh, sorry, did you say if we were changing the DOM dynamic? So, like, um, as an example on Gitter, we've got um, like a little badge, like, sorry, a little tick when uh, something gets marked as red um, and by, by other people, and that gets inserted dynamically on basically the first person other than you marking the message as red. Um, and that we basically create the, the extra DOM element and then we just hold a reference to that. Um, and so it becomes like this dot dollar uh, mark, uh, whatever it is, like red bar, re, re, red bar yeah. And, uh, and we just hold that reference and we just use that. I mean, that's kind of a, a silly case because we don't really make any changes after we've inserted it. So, uh, although we do because we've got the mouse over, but yeah, I mean, generally we try to we try not to use uh, this dot dollar l dot find because it, it's that slows things down even more. Any other questions? Who uses Gitter? Oh, this is just. Just wonder, have you planned to like move away from jQuery, like future proof? Well, there's, there's, I, it just, it I looks like there's a, there's a, it well. looks like there's a marionette sort of, I don't know what marionette metal it is. Uh, has anyone heard of it? Yeah, it's metal. Yeah, bringing, <laughs> Jamie, is there, you can talk about it more. Bringing more um, class object oriented paradigms that you've come to expect from other frameworks right. into marionette. Okay. Um, like super. I wasn't okay. Yeah, so it's more it's of not, a, it's not an object-oriented helper. Right. Okay. It's not gonna help with DOM at all. 
Because I okay, then I've seen I've but, seen a I've seen a this this a guy that did a talk on like what you need for backbone. Backbone this, one two one yeah. just uh, one two um, provides an interface for yeah. eliminating jQuery from yeah. your pure backbone code. Yeah. And so there's an open discussion about what that could mean for Marionette, but yeah. um, we haven't settled on that. Okay. Yeah, because I mean that would be because we're bound to jQuery in more ways than backbone. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you're really into isomorphic JS, so that means you are on your way to leaving jQuery behind and moving into a virtual DOM like yeah. to React, for yeah. example. So we, well, we'll marinate virtual DOM. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that would be fantastic. Um, obviously, it's, I mean, this, that stuff that we, all those hacks that we put in there um, would be really hard, would be much easier if we had a virtual DOM um, and I, I see there's like a few issues in the Marinette uh, repos, yeah. and guys are like working towards it. So I, I, I did like a very brief, like one night um, hack together that virtual DOM yeah. project, but I, it, it was like completely simplistic because yeah. it didn't have managed like the view hierarchies, it was only like a single level, so it's like really easy to do it like that. But obviously, what you really want. Is sort of the whole view, view hierarchy being handled <coughs> by a, a single virtual DOM. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, also just another thing to say on that is uh, we, we've got a, a heavy investment mm -hmm. and a lot of code in this area, and obviously you can adopt React like kind of piecemeal in certain places. But you know, we're not about you know to change the whole thing to something like React would be a huge investment from from yeah. our, on our behalf. And the other thing to say about like running it side by side is we have done these. Like external experiments where, like for whatever reason, someone was like, "Okay, here's this other little app that we use over here, like for our billing sites or whatever," and like we'll just use Jade for that, mm -hmm. right? And then like everything's in handlebars, and then someone goes and like gets into this, and now it's Jade, and everything's completely different, and yeah, no, you're you know, great. so it's like it's it's just. Also, just another important thing to consider, like how many things you adopt and how, how much your, your team can deal with, because we're a small team. No, we are. What, what, what you're doing is actually great. Right? Yeah, you're going to experiment with React yeah. eventually. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, it's like good. We, 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 it we, we, we've done some experiments. With yeah. Like, like, yeah. 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 A lot of stuff. Yeah. I was curious, what pieces do you render on the server? So, um, like the entire page load, or just like the layout, so, everything but the chat? Um, so extreme. pretty much, um, I'm trying to think what we don't render on the server. We don't do like some of we the don't do the suggested like, rooms. Yeah, yeah, and some of the like decorators. Yeah. Right. So, so if, um, uh, do you, so let's maybe, maybe bring it up. Uh, uh, it's on the screen somewhere here. So where is this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's like kind of weird scrolling. Um, so like anytime something is like these things are decorated, there is like there's no mention of issue here. Um, like you know if you mention an issue and it kind of highlights and so some of those things will actually happen after the fact because we might need to go and look them up against GitHub and see what the status is, and obviously we don't want to wait, you know, for all of those types of things, but pretty much, like, the whole of the, the left menu is pre-rendered. Except for the suggested room. Yeah. Uh, this is pre-rendered, that's pre like, pretty much everything is pre-rendered. So the, the one that Andrew showed you, all he did was turn off the pre-rendering of the chat, so everything else was still being pre-rendered. Does it come in as one? Chunk of HTML, or are you bringing in pieces like it, layout? There's, and there's then, actually you know. so there's actually two chunks of HTML, um, and you can go into that if you want. But this is actually my frame, uh, and then this is a this is the parent frame, um, and we did that actually. It was kind of like a, a course that we sort of we went on because we we're trying to make it more SBA, and I'm actually kind of like happy with it. Because the great thing about doing that is uh, if you do have any memory leaks, when you change rooms, that context just gets trashed. Um, and so you, you, you kind of, it's kind of like a really um, cheap way of keeping your memory down. 
Um, there, there's other reasons why it works really well for us, but um, so that's so this so this and this start loading pretty much at the same time. We use uh, I forgot the name of the technology, but you can basically tell Chrome like really early on to start fetching like another resource. Um, so before it's even passed the HTML, you can say like, oh, and you're going to need this as well. And so it kind of downloads that and that in parallel. I forgot what it's, it's called. The async deferred. No, no, no. It's um. So like it's, like a, it's, a, it's like a link, and you can do it either in a header or you can do it as a link, uh, like a href. Oh. Yeah, like I forgot what it's called now, but it's quite a useful thing because you, you like for example, we know when you hit the the parent page that you're going to need or the browser's going to need like the common chunk of JavaScript that's shared between all the pages. It's going to need the chunk of JavaScript for this frame, this frame. It's going to need the actual frame itself, and you can push that all out like very early on, so the browser actually starts fetching those things um, before, you know, before it's actually passed the, that frame, if that, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah. um, and, and so that's kind of a way of parallelizing that stuff as well. So there's, there's two chunks, but other than that, there's basically just two chunks of HTML. Parts of your app were developed specifically for So on this, I can't remember if we pre-rendered on mobile. Um, but but the, what was what was it, the question again? Like which how much, well, what was rendered on the server or the client for mobile, and what part of the app was optimized for mobile? Um, so the I mean on the iOS app, for example, the chat content is um, is all uh, web, so it's uh, all HTML, CSS. The left menu. Um, is native, and the only reason for that was really we just couldn't get something that like was smooth enough, um, like opening and closing. And I don't know, like our mobile app is not has like traditionally not been brilliant. It's, we don't see the nature of um, like you know our audience. So they're behind their desktops all the time, and you know the amount of usage on this is actually really low. So we haven't invested heavily in it. Although we did just recently push a change to the app store. Where we've made this a lot faster, and like some of the connectivity problems have gone away. Although, whatever is causing my like throttled four megabits per second, like roaming thing, is like again causing some problems with that. And we've got some other fixes doing out there. But like certainly, there's a lot more stuff we could do to make mobile better. It's just not really something we spend a lot of time on. Are there also on Android? Yeah, yeah. Uh, four four and upwards. Because it's a web, a web view and it's some, uh, between pre 4.4 and, and where it broke uh, like web view compatibility. But it was also, it wasn't Chrome before 4.4. Oh yeah, it was, it was Android that, like, browser. Horrible, yeah. Just like, it just works those things. Thing. Are you native on Android? Or are you no, it's, it's, also, it's also hybrid. Like, the, like there are native components, but the web view, you know, once again, like being a small team, you know, this code that drives this yeah. is the same code that drives mobile, and so, yeah. you know, anytime we make changes to this, the mobile can easily inherit it, and, it's, you know, we've, like, again, we haven't spent a huge amount of time making it work, but we have to spend some time making it work, and we get benefits from it, you know, once again, like, if, if the team was much larger, and we had, you know, full-time iOS and Android guys, then we might do that, but, you know, we're not really a mobile first use case, and so yeah. we don't really do that. What are you using to, like, for example, code once deploy everywhere, like Accelerator, Phone Guy? Yeah, like, what are you using? We, it's pretty much like um, we took the, like, we, we took the, the Cordova, the part of Cordova yeah. that lets you talk between the web view just and the outside world. Yeah, but just the, the like course, literally yeah. the part that just does the communication. Oh, cool. so we took that out and we pretty much dropped the rest of it. Right. And then inside it's just JavaScript and HTML. And we, we went through this like time where we made this like thing that we actually used app cache in there. And we had this thing that we did <laughs> so clever for about five minutes where you could change, we could deploy on the server. And the app cache would recognize that there's a new version, and we could get all the iOS clients to basically get a new version of the of the code without us having to go through the app store. Yeah. Which we thought was very clever, and so we realized like how bad 
app cache is and how evil it is and how flaky it is. And so we got rid of that. But basically, it's it's HTML and just that little bit of code over that lets you talk between native and web. So we're talking about a, a web app, basically. Uh, yeah, web web app except for the left menu. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, you would really enjoy uh, React Native eventually. Yeah. Um, it would be great to run the whole I know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, it's, it, it's, it's something we considered and, like, we've spoken about it, and, like, but there's still there's still a huge amount of investment we'd have to make. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting piece of technology. I, I would love to have, like, everything in JavaScript. And so, like, when you have to go and, like, write, like, my Objective-C is, like, very messy. And so, like, the iOS app is like quite a, a messy app. Like, maybe if you're like a really good Objective C coder, you'd like have beautiful Objective C yeah, apps. But Swift is very and good. Just, uh, yeah, Swift. but I'd, I'd much rather have everything in JavaScript and the, you know, the piece of code that takes like that name and shortens it to make it fit in there. Like, if that was the same code in iOS and on like the web, that would make me like even happier. Because at the moment, we've got to have like a Objective C implementation of that, and then a JavaScript implementation. And if we had like one implementation, that would be like awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's Apple's fault, right? It's Apple's fault. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely our own fault. Yeah. Yeah. E everything you see you see here is self-inflicted. Yeah. yeah. Like, are you familiar with App Accelerator? Are we? App Accelerator. Looked at it like a long time. It's JavaScript. Yeah. We can yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. We've we, we looked at we've looked at some of those frameworks. And I can't remember why, but like there were certain things that just didn't work for us at the time. Yeah. But again, you know, we haven't been able to revisit all of these decisions. Basically. No, no, but that's great. Great. Cool. Question about your chat room. Um, what's the chat room like? Is it when someone enters? Logs in to the room once it's counted. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Like, I mean, we don't. I mean, we have the concept of leaving a room. Like, so if you manually leave the room, but we never. You know, it's not like IOC where, you know, if you, you close the app and you're gone because it's persistent and in the cloud. But like, you know, there's probably some stuff we should we can do about like just. Because sometimes I'm kind of curious, like. How many people, people are really are really yeah. talking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we that's something we do. Yeah. Job. So like one one of the things we did, like this is a server side one, but you know, for example, every time you send a chat message, we obviously track like who's read it because you know you get the unread counts for everything, and so imagine in like your room where you send a chat message, and then in Redis we have like you know, tracking this message across 5,000 people, whether or not they've read it. So every time, like, people are sending messages, that kind of thing starts happening, You're basically, like, creating these storms in Redis um, that can go pretty high. I mean, like, we've seen Redis doing, like, 60-odd thousand operations a second when, when stuff's happening like that. And so, like, some of the stuff we've done is... Um, when we were seeing some of those performance issues, is when, when you lurk in a room, that doesn't happen anymore. We don't track the unread messages at all. And so we did some like auto lurking of people where if they've been idle for more than a month, we just auto lurk them. Like whether or not we auto remove them is something we might want to do. It just feels we're very British, even though we're both South African. <laughs> it's like, what? Remove someone from a room without their consent? Um, so, you know, <laughs> maybe we should be a bit more aggressive about that one. We noticed that scrolling got a lot better about a couple months ago. Yeah. yeah. A few months ago. Yeah. That was a lot of that was to do with all of that uh, front end stuff. So there, there was a big, nasty table scan in um, MongoDB, which is when you hit the top. It was basically doing like uh, however many messages were in the room scan, mm -hmm. and it was like a really petty, silly like Mongo reason. Um, you know, it's so something which obviously was going to work, but actually it didn't work. Um, and so, if you hit, if you hit like in a big room that had like thousands of messages, uh, or, uh, like uh, tens of thousands of messages, if you s scroll to the top and you needed to fetch the next row or the next chunk of messages. Um, basically, it did like a massive table scan on, on MongoDB, and 
that was like really easy to fix. We actually wrote like this really cool little open source library which we keep like threatening to actually release. <laughs> uh, we kind of got it as open source but it's a bit broken at the moment. And but what it does is it just connects to MongoDB and just tails the slow logs um, and gives you like tons of information about the queries. Mm -hmm. Like in real time, it's just got a WebSocket connection. Um, and it's like, so you've just got, you open a web page, you put it on like your other monitor, and like you just develop and you just start seeing like these things which you kind of assume would be like absolutely fine, but you know, are really hitting MongoDB badly. And you go like, ah, play around with it a bit, fix it, um, and that was that really helped with the scrolling. But then obviously the client side, there was tons of stuff that we did for that as well, which, which yeah. made a big difference. I mean, it's, yeah. so, is it even <laughs> available? It, it is, but it's broken. At yeah. The <laughs> okay. So yeah, you can also set a support request. And yeah. then there was another thing we did, so most of that stuff was client was server side, but there was some client side work where. Like we don't, and this really helped with the frames per second. Was we don't um, when you're scrolling. So obviously scrolling has changed a lot. Once upon a time you used to like go and off to the side and drag this thing, and now you know you scroll with two fingers and you're basically hovering over stuff. And we've got hover events, you know, over so many things. And what we do now is when you're scrolling, we um, block. We, we don't do any hover behavior. Yeah, we just disable those. Basically, rules. so nothing. Is pointer know, events none. The point using pointer events none. I, it was uh, one of the guys, Mara did it, I'm not actually sure how he implemented it, but basically all of the hover stuff turns off while we're scrolling. Yeah, and that, that helps a lot with like the FPS on the client side. Yeah, the, the whole thing with actually getting like reverse scrolling working is like a complete nightmare. Because <laughs> if you add like new content at the bottom, you know, your browser doesn't change, so you've got to do all that, and that's like... Yeah, if you add if you add new content at the top, all of a sudden like down, push things down. If you if you load an image over there oh. and that image gets big, your browser always pushes everything down. So you've got to do like all sorts of crazy tricks to get the browser to like not do that. Because um, it's, it's like always the origin is always the top of the page. Yeah, it's like basically to lock the scroll position when content above you is changing. It's fine like an infinite scroll. When you're loading more content yeah. below, right, because your scroll position doesn't change, but when content's loading above you, and then some of them might be embeds and they'll load, and then the embed will kick in and it'll get even bigger yeah. and then it'll push you further down. So and you've, so, got to, you've basically got to detect all the reflows yeah. and then kind of keep track of where it was before the reflow and then try and make it do that again. And the request animation frame before the user sees it. So, actually, what's happening, like when that content's loading, is it's scrolling down. And it's scrolling back like really quickly, <laughs> so, so it just happens in the same yeah. repaint. Do you? <laughs> so it's, it's crazy stuff. Like, um, have you guys explored Flashbox at all? Yeah, we actually deleted There were a few slides that we had in here that we like thought maybe we were out of time for. One of the slides was an app cache slide. The other one was a uh, Flexbox slides. So we like pretty much moved as much as possible to Flexbox. Um, and, like. Neither of us are like get that involved with it, and so we didn't feel that we could talk to it that well. One of our other guys, Andy, um, is like the flexbox all the things guy, um, but like certainly it does make you know things a lot easier where you know you've got like different size contents. Um, and the other one we, we had that we wanted to talk about, and maybe we can talk about this another time or whatever, was I mean CSS, like how we name things. Um, naming things is hard. And, like at the moment, we kind of use BEM. I don't know if anyone's used BEM, and like there's some things that we don't like about that, and it just it seems to be overly verbose. So now we're looking at using um, CSS modules. CSS modules with, with Webpack, really. Um, just going one point on the flexbox, which we found was like um, really important, and that is uh, when we started doing flexbox, we noticed these like little flashes. Uh, when the page was loading, and you could never like quite capture them, but it was like as the page was loading, stuff would like jump around. Um, and so what we started doing was like we'd take the, the rendered page or the HTML for the page, and then you, you just basically go like in your editor, you delete like 75% of it, and you put it into, you basically serve that up and see how it renders it. And then you do the same thing at 50%, you chop it off, 
and you see how it renders it. And often what happens with Flexbox is it, um, before you've got the full content, it lays it out like in a completely crazy manner. And so like this toolbar over here was loading over here. And then as more and more content like comes in, it moves everything around. So it's really good to test with Flexbox and make sure that um, you know, if, if that happens, like if you've got like a really slow connection, like the first time it renders this toolbar, it needs to render on the right hand side because otherwise you get this really like unpleasant effect, yeah, which you can't really like. But it's really fast, it's slow. But it's still it's like, like nasty. Yeah, it's like, yeah. like Tyler Durden appearing, you know, like, <laughs> just like one more frame basically. Yeah. Would one one invisible pixels No, what it was was we just like made the rules like much more stringent. So like. Um, like this guy, like it was kind of like he was getting pushed there by this content and so it was kind of by default but then like what we did was we made it like much more strict so even if this content hasn't arrived in the browser, like this guy will always go on the right hand side and so you can either have it like sort of like different blocks push other blocks of content around and into place or you can make it like super stringent and that made like a very big difference to the Flexbox, like start time. Another thing to do is just to like throttle your browser down to like stupid slow and just refresh and refresh and refresh and see if the flex boxes move around as your page is getting rendered. Yeah. So, since so you have a small team, I know this is front end, what is your back end? A node. Yeah. So, Did you try Firebase? Um, no. no. Yeah. yeah. I looked at it, it's like an awesome little project. Well, not little it's an it's awesome script. project. Yeah, yeah. JavaScript. <laughs> yeah, it's like when we're pretty much JavaScript top to bottom, front to back, <laughs> with a <laughs> small yeah. bit of C sharp and a small bit of Java on the Android. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Alright. Cool. Is that it?